So listen, last week I preached a message, and this is part two of that message. I titled it, uh, Jesus, His Divine Glory, I believe is what I called it. Sometimes, you know, titles don't always seem to speak what, what you're sp speaking, but in my mind what I was believing was that the things that we were going to talk about is really the divine glory of the Lord, amen, and that these things are manifest in our life, and so it's His divine glory that's shining through us is what I was thinking, okay? So so this is Jesus, His divine glory, part number two, subcaption, brotherly love, amen? And so what we talked about was we read out of Second Peter chapter 1, and we can actually go back there. I read the whole chapter last time. I'm not going to read the whole chapter again. It's a long chapter, but what we are going to do in the ESV version, translation of the Bible, we're going to read verses 1 through 10 of Second Peter chapter 1. If we can get that queued up, and when we do, here we go. Uh, well, let me just go ahead and read it from here. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. My, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will, you will never fall. We thank you for your word, Lord. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to unpack the truths that are in this word, Lord God. That it would come alive on the inside. Holy Spirit, that you would do what only you can do. And that you would take the word of God and that you'd make it living, Lord. Let it reach in, Lord God, and it begin to transform us on the inside, Lord, that we become more like you, Lord, and less like us, that, that the old man that we used to be born of Adam would die and continue to die so that Christ could be formed in us, Lord. That's what my prayer is for these people this morning. Anyone that would listen to this message, but it's my prayer for myself, and it's been my prayer, Lord, for some time now that, that like the Apostle Paul said, how I travail until Christ be formed in you. I pray that Christ would be formed in your people, Lord, in Jesus. Jesus name we pray amen. Amen. amen so last week what we did was we, we covered some things you know uh, Peter says also in this chapter he says listen the, the Lord has showed me that the departure from the body is imminent in other words he knew that he was about to go to be with the Lord and he said so I have to keep you in remembrance of these things it's very important that you be reminded of these truths he said I want to keep reminding you of these truths until something happens because he said listen I was with him on the holy mount that's what Peter said I was with him on the holy mount and he said I saw the glory that came out of him yeah. Peter said we are not trying to talk to you about cleverly or cunningly devised fables little stories that were written in some back alley somewhere that people start no no we were there with him on the mount and we saw him transfigured before our very eyes the glory of God shone out of him and I'm here to tell you that this is a confirmation of the word of prophecy that was spoken in ages past and you would do well to listen to this word and keep listening to it until something happens. Yes, yes. Amen. Something's gonna happen. Amen. And what he said was the day star 
is going to rise in your heart. The day star is going to rise in your heart. And see, if the day star hasn't risen in your heart, then you don't really know what I'm talking about. But if the day star ever rose in your heart, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's when the light of Jesus comes up and, and, and opens up and, and becomes alive on the inside. It's basically when a person who was dead in their sin gets born again. When a person that calls on the name of Jesus, hallelujah, and the Holy Spirit moves in and he does a recreation to the heart. The, le the letter that Paul wrote to Titus said, they, that you, you've been regenerated. You got regened. You, you got transformed. You were an old creation, but that's passed away and all things have become new. Yes. We live in the midst of a time frame in the church whenever it's just kind of like a lot of times. I'm not saying that y'all are like that, but we all, I think if we're not careful, we can all fall into that. And I know I've been there before where it's just not like church as usual, right? We just kind of go on through the motions. Get up, set our alarm, put on our clothes, show up to the house of God, just go through the motions. I don't know about you, but I'm not interested in that kind of Christianity. I want to, I want to allow God to have his way in my life. And whenever I stand and look him in the eyes on the other side of that spiritual Jordan, I want to know that I had a hold of the real Jesus. I want to know that I had a real a, a, a hold on the biblical Christ. Amen. And that and that he was alive and well in my heart. And that's Amen. my cry for you this morning. That's the, what I've been praying for you as I seek God for the people of God. Because, see, you're not my people. You're his people. Yeah. I'm an under shepherd. Yeah. I'm not a hireling, but I'm an under shepherd. Hallelujah. And, and, and my job is to speak forth the truth of the shepherd, Amen. the good shepherd, the one that laid his life down for the sheep. Amen. He purchased you. If you are a believer this morning, and if you're not yet, hallelujah, it's just one call away. Yeah. You can call on his name. I know every time I start preaching now, I hear the song come, and there's a song. Call on his name, Jesus. That's all it takes. Yeah. Is call on his name. And you mean yeah. business from your heart. And when you do the day story. The day star will rise. And so, so he said, I got to keep telling you these things. I got to keep bringing them in your remembrance so that this day star is going to rise in your heart. We talked about that, about what it means to be born again. Because, see, you can't add something to your faith in order to earn righteousness. It's very important that Christians understand that. Because many times in the house of God, in the church of God, or in religion, mankind tries to start working to earning his way towards holiness, towards righteousness, and then he begins to compare himself to other people, and he's like, well, in comparison to sister so-and-so, I'm doing pretty good with the Lord, hallelujah, because I noticed last Sunday I had both hands raised fully in the air with elbows extended, and she only had one hand, and her elbow was bent a little bit. The sister on the side of you or me is not the plumb line, right? It's Jesus, and he is righteousness, amen? And he's the gift of righteousness that the Father gave for us, and, and he allowed a transference to take place on a hill called Calvary where there was a cross upon which he died. And the exchange that took place, the transference that took place was that when he died, the Bible says that God, and there's one scripture in here, in some of the multiple scriptures that I put in this message, that he became a propitiation for us. Yeah. It means that all of God's wrath was poured out upon his son for you and, and for me. And so he allowed the guilt of the human race to be placed on Jesus. And when Jesus died, guess what? And you put faith in that. See, you got to put faith in that. You have to. Jesus has already died for the whole world. Yeah. He's already died for each and every one of us yeah. in this. But there's countless billions that refuse to go the way of God. They refuse and they choose instead to try to create their own way. And, and, and that's that God's not going to accept that. But when you accept God's way... By faith, and you acknowledge to him, yes, I need you, Lord. An amazing spiritual exchange takes place in the spirit, in the heavenly realm. Amen. And that's when the day star rises. And he takes your guilt. Amen. And he places his righteousness upon you. And so that's salvation. And that's righteousness. And righteousness is a gift 
that's given to us. Amen. And so there's no earning righteousness with God. But what these virtues are speaking of, what these qualities are speaking of, these are the attributes that are in the lives of true believers. We covered the first five last week, virtue, which just basically means moral goodness. See, when the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, He starts to change and transform yes. your life to where moral goodness is and becomes a desire for you to live in a moral goodness way. When the Holy Spirit starts to have His way in your heart, I'm just going to be real with you. Like, this is the way it's going. Now, listen. Let me be clear about this too. The journey from the day that you got saved to the day that you see him and you come to the place where, where you will see him and you will look in his eyes, amen, is a process. Sanctification is immediate and we don't have time to get into the, de the depth of the theology behind all this. But let me just say this. While sanctification is an immediate thing, there's also an ongoing journey. Yes. And the ongoing journey results in you dying to yourself so that Christ can be formed in you. Yes, yes. And as if we refuse to allow the Holy Spirit to have His way in us, where we die, where we're willing to die to ourselves, then, then then the image of Christ is not really being it's it's let's be it's being thwarted. The, the, the production and the forming and the fashioning of Jesus on the inside of the vessel of the believer is being thwarted. It's being, uh, it's being slowed down. We're supposed to be working in unison with the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God. If we don't put the Word of God in our heart, how are we to know God's will upon the earth? Right? And as we put the Word of God in our heart and the Holy Spirit brings conviction to things in our lives, he begins to reveal to us. So virtue is moral goodness. I don't mean to go ahead and preach to all of them again, but virtue is moral goodness. And whenever you find yourself out in a world that's full of wickedness, you are supposed to be different. Yes. If the day star is risen in your heart, you're supposed to be different. Yes. I'm preaching the truth. Yes. That means the stuff that you scroll on social media ain't supposed to look like the same stuff that people that ain't had the day star risen in their heart scrolling on. Yes. Well, I don't like the way you preach. Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't like the stuff we look at. Come on. Up. Somebody got to help me out here because the Holy Spirit, his, the adjective that describes who he is, is holy. He's holy. Then the good news is, is that Jesus died to break the bondage and the power of sin in your life. And so you now can walk in freedom and liberty. And you can start to say no to the things that are preventing Christ from being formed in you. Because that's God's will for your life, my friend. I've said this many times. I'm a nurse practitioner too. But God's will for my life is not to be the best nurse practitioner. Man. God's will for my life is to allow Christ to be formed in you. Yes. So that I will bring glory and honor to my Father because my Father bankrupted heaven of its most prized possession. My Father sent Jesus to die for me and to pay the penalty for me. And now it, the, the least I can do is to be a living sacrifice. Yes, yes, yes. Romans chapter 12, it's not even in the nose, but he said, he said, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Present yourselves a living sacrifice. Oh, in, in, in the wording in the Greek, the idea is that it's not even an extravagant thing. It's like the least you can do after you realize what God has done for you. Uh, I guess I'm going to get to preach my message this morning, but I keep hearing the Lord ringing it in my spirit. He's saying, I don't think that my people understand the gift of eternal life. I don't think that they really understand this gift that I have given them of eternal life. Because everybody just seems to think that we're just going to skip in. Like there didn't have to be any kind of change. No kind of transformation on the inside of us. And we're just going to, hallelujah, I made it in. Praise God. And, and you know what? It is a gift. Let me not take away from that. It is a gift. But, but the Lord desires our heart. Yes, yes. He desires for, for us to allow him to change us. So that the beauty of Jesus can come out of him. So that people can see him. That's right. the, the second one was knowledge. 
You know, look, we went into a whole lot about knowledge because, see, if you're not careful, knowledge puff up. Yes. Yes. But if you stop there and you don't remember what he said in the book of Hosea, he said, my people perish without a lack of knowledge. Yes, yes. So our knowledge has to be has to also be folded in with love. <laughs> Amen. And that's a whole other story right there. Like, okay, well, what is love? This kind of reminds me of the uh, of whenever Jesus had that conversation with the rich man. Right? He said, you got to love your neighbor. And he said, well, who's my neighbor? Because he's trying to justify himself. He's trying to get out of the situation. Anyway, let's not get into that kind of love right now because we got a whole lot of love to talk about this morning. Knowledge. But you know, knowledge goes from just being informational. Although that word right there in, that we read, it's about information. You've got to put the, you have to put the, the truth in your heart. But there's something also about the word knowledge that there's an added level to it, epignosis. This is gnosis, epignosis is experiential. When you start to put the information of God in your heart and you go through the trials of life and the journeys of life and you begin to experience the trial and the tribulation and the storms of life and you learn how to trust in the Lord, amen, and the Lord reciprocates and he does a work in your heart, you begin to gain an experiential knowledge yes, of yes. the goodness of God and the power of God working in your life. Next was self-control. You know, they're, they're, do I need to say more? It's a fruit of the spirit. Amen. That's right, and we all need self-control, right? Yes, in various yes. areas of our life. We need the Holy Spirit. I need you to work in my heart and in my life. I need your self-control. Sometimes whenever we get rid of all the stuff, we get rid of the drugs, the alcohol, the porn, we get rid of all these other things like that, right? And then the next thing you know, Lord, I need self-control with my tongue. <laughs> yes. Lord, help me. I need self-control with my tongue. Amen. Steadfastness, endurance. You know, our Lord didn't quit on us when he carried the cross up the hill. He didn't quit. The word is endurance. And in the Greek, it's hupo under mone remain. Under remain is the literal term. Remain under the trial. Don't quit. Don't give up. The enemy's coming against you. He's trying to steal your joy. He's trying to steal. He wants to destroy you. And now listen, we got different people in here with different opinions about things. And look, maybe the enemy can't. No, I don't. The enemy can't steal your salvation. I know that because you're in the hand of the Father. Right. But guess what? He sure can make your life miserable and make you feel like you want to quit. But you, we're not to give in to that. We must endure through the power of the Holy Spirit to trust in the finished work of Christ and the grace that flows through that. Amen. And then the last one that we talked about last week was godliness. God is kind of like the virtue thing a little bit. It's godliness in the midst of a wicked society. You know, it's not it's not cool to talk like they talk. That's right. It's not. And, and you know, look, there's always going to be a, a man that's more alpha male than, than the next guy. There'll always be somebody that looks cooler than the next person. And we're always trying to like, oh, like I'm around. You know, this kind of stuff happens in businesses a lot. The reason I know this is because <laughs> my dad was in the oil field. And back in those days, you wind and dine them is what my dad said. Oh, my, what is my job to wind and dine them, boy? Well, how in the world are you a new creation in Christ? And the day star is risen in your heart. And, and you, you're you going to sit here, right? I wonder sometimes about attorneys. If there's any attorneys in the house, I'm not picking on lawyers, but sometimes we just shift the truth. How do we live a life like that? Like where where it's okay. Well, this is just business, preacher. We do this for business. And then, and then, and then when we come to that, no, 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 that don't work like that, my friend. And he's not accepting that kind of a sacrifice. He's looking for godliness because Jesus was, that's how Jesus handled his business. Amen. And to trust God. Amen. So just because you're, just because you're on some kind of a deal where, and they act a certain way and they expect you to act a certain way. No, you better. As a matter of fact, the proverb says that whenever you sit at the, the table of a king, right. if you're a man given to appetite, he said, I think he said, put a, throat, a knife to your throat, right. shoot from the hip. Yeah. But basically, he's saying, you'd be better off just go ahead and take, let yourself be taken out right now than to go ahead and to enjoy his delicacies and allow yourself to be lowered in his presence. Because guess what? You're, you're going to open up a door. And that's what a lot of times people, the people of God don't understand. They're opening up doors. Yes. They're opening up doors and they're allowing because, see, you're not in a war with flesh and blood, the Bible says. You're in a war with principalities and powers and, you're, and, 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 and world rulers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And when we yield, and listen, this isn't my message, so let me keep going. But when we yield to these things, we're giving permission with, with whatever it is. We're giving permission for these things to happen in our life. All right, so before we get into the last two, which is actually 
brotherly love and love or brotherly affection and love. I just wanted to say a couple of things about the heart because I believe that's really what I want to. I feel like the Lord's wanting lately been wanting me to deal with because he's dealing with my own heart and he wants me to encourage you to allow him to deal with your heart. And, and I can't get this through clearly enough that we can we can put. You, you know, the word hypocrite in the Greek New Testament, it's hypocritos. And you know what it means? It means to be an actor on a stage with a mask. Yeah. Yeah. So we can put a mask on. And, and, if, and if we're honest with one another, many, many of us have probably lived parts of our Christian journey if we've been in the faith for any length of time where we, that's what we were doing. Where we put a mask on. And we and we and we were living one way, but we're able to exude or to portray something else outwardly. And nobody necessarily has to know unless they're really close to us. They might figure it out. But there's things that are going on inside of the heart. And what, what I wanted to share with you this morning when it comes to brotherly love and the love of God. Amen. That these are these are things that are connected very deeply into the heart. And, and we'll try to. We'll ask the Lord to help us to explain that. So this is kind of technical, and one day I'll probably do a little further teaching on it. But the heart of man, I just want you to know this is a very special place. And, and, and I don't expect you to remember all this, and hopefully I'm, I'm not going too deep for this right here. But it's a place where the thoughts of the soul's mind and the emotions of the soul's the emotions of the soul's emotions mixed together. It's a place where the thoughts, this is what I believe. You may not uh, completely understand what I'm trying to say. You may not completely agree with what I'm trying to say, but this is what I believe as I study out the soul and the spirit, right? And, 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 and let, let me just be clear. Many of you have been sitting in these sermons that I preach and I draw on the board all the, and then we really break it down. And so some of you haven't been privy to that. And so I apologize for that. But let me just say this. There's only one thing that can separate the soul and the spirit. And it's the word of God. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. The word of God is alive and powerful. Yeah. Quick and powerful. Sharper than a two-edged sword. It divides asunder between joint and marrow. Soul and spirit. Yeah. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And, but, but yet the soul is not exactly the spirit. The spirit is not exactly the soul. And you are, a, you are a spirit being. Amen. God is spirit. You are spirit. Amen. Angels are spirit. Demons are spirit. You're the only one left with a terrestrial body unless a demon... Well, anyway, that's not really right. <laughs> but you have an earthly body. But you're a spirit in an earthly body. Amen. But your spiritual... The spiritual aspect of you is what makes you eternal. <laughs> it's very important that you understand you are an eternal being. Yes. And it's also important that based on Luke chapter 16, that your eternity is going to have a memory. Right. Right. You, remember, you remember the rich man and Lazarus, they were in, one was in torment, one was in paradise. He said, he said, he remembered, <coughs> and he remembered that he had brothers. Yes. And he said, won't you send somebody? So your eternity is going to have a memory. Yes. Amen. Amen. And, and, and now if you're in heaven, you won't, at, at some point in time when you get to heaven, you won't remember the tears anymore. Yeah. Amen. You won't remember the pain and the heartache, but that's another story for another time. So, so the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. Yes. What I think, what I think. Now, as the time frame of Christianity goes forward in my walk, my thinking, if I, if I yield to the Lord... My thinking becomes more like his thinking. Yes, yes. It becomes more like the word of God. Yes. But that's why the scripture says that your new man, the mind of your new man must be renewed. Yes. Yes. And you're not allowed. If you've been bought with a price, the price of the precious blood of the lamb, you don't belong to yourself anymore. You right. can't just think what you want to think. Yes. Now, I can get up here as the preacher and I can sit here and poke around and get people irritated. That's not really what I want to do, but I just want to be able to speak the truth freely. But, but, but that alone is not going to do it, right? I can provoke. I can challenge. We can poke around. But what we really need is the Holy Spirit yes. through the Word of God.
to reinculturate us, yes, to yes. change the way we think from what we thought previously to what the Word of God says. Yes. Yes. Amen. And so, so your mind is what you think, and your and your 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 emotions are what you feel. Amen. How many times have you been told you don't worship the Lord based on the way you feel? Because that's not reality. That's yes. not truth. Truth is God is worthy yes. to receive His glory and His yes. honor. That's the truth. And, and so your emotions are what you feel and, and your, um, your mind, your will, and your will is what you want. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. your will is what you want. I want this. But this that you want is contrary to the word of God. Right, right. I want this and I will allow some kind of weird process to happen in my mind where I will justify my decisions. Oh. Give it to you. Oh, man. We has that, that had never happened to y'all before. Come on. <laughs> where you literally do something weird in your mind to where you know the Word of God says something, but yet somehow you fabricate something to make it okay because you want what you want more than you want God to have what He wants because our heart isn't what Jesus' heart is because Jesus said, Father, not my will, but your will. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Right? And so I wanted you to say this, though, but the heart is such an interesting thing Thing because it's, it, whenever I read behind these scholars and these Greek scholars, these theologians, it's like the heart. You ever seen a place, if you can see an aerial view, just imagine this, where the river runs into a blue ocean. Just imagine a dirty river. Like It doesn't have to be dirty, but where you can see the two mixing. I'm not trying to make it polluted. I'm just saying where the river <laughs> flows into the ocean and you can see the two are mixed. It's like, I'm trying to give you a visual because it's like the idea of the heart is that place that's kind of like coming from the spirit or it's coming from the world, but it's a mixture of the soul because it's made up of the thoughts and it's also made up of the emotions and whatever it is that you're allowing to influence, you grab the hold of your heart. Does that make sense? What has your heart? Oh, you know, some people just love music so much. Oh, no, this genre of music, man, this has in their whole life, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm not, I'm not trying to be yeah. weird, but it's like, oh, I am not happy unless I get to listen to this kind of music. Or this man has my heart. This woman has my heart right now, yep. right? Or, you know, whatever. This is... It's the thing that's in my heart. It's what I think about. It's what it's what I arrange my day around. It's 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 what I prepare for. And and, and see the things of the world, the world, the flesh, the devil, but also our flesh. They they're in a they're in a battle with the spirit. That if you're born again, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. That's right. See, when you get born again, something happens to your spirit, man. Yes, yes. But the world didn't go away, and, and the devil didn't go away, right? And your flesh still has things that it wants. And so there's a battle that's raging. Yes, yes. But the spirit, man, that's been renewed in the spirit, yes. the Holy Spirit saying, I want your heart, son. Yes. This place belongs to Jesus. Yeah. This place right here belongs to the eternal Lamb of God who died to take away your sin. Yeah. This is His place. It's a special place. And it's all for Him. Yeah. And you got to give it to Him. Yeah. And He's not like, like that song that Micah sings. He won't relent. He won't relent. Thank you, Jesus. Just hold on a second. He won't relent. He won't relent until he has no. He's not gonna quit. Yes, yes. He's not gonna quit. He wants to see virtue. He wants to. He wants you to be hungry for the knowledge of God. He wants you to endure. He wants Jesus to have the spot in your heart. Yes. And he's not gonna relent. Yes. If you belong to him, if you've truly been born again, he's not gonna stop until he gets it all. Yes, yes. 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 yes, He wants it all. Yes. Sing that a little bit. You won't relent till you have it all. My heart is yours. You won't relent till you have it all. My heart is yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. 
We give you our heart this morning. Yes. We want you to have your way with our hearts this yes. morning. Lord, do a work in us. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So that's the heart. You know, Peter said, he said, sanctify the Lord in your heart. Yes. Yes. In the King James Version, it says, sanctify the Lord in your heart. The ESV says, honor the Lord. No, that's not good enough, my friend. That word honor, that's not the right translation for that word. No, it needs sanctify, hagiazo, make holy. The, the heart must be holy. It's a separated place. It's a special place. It, it, that's what the word sanctification means. It means to be separated out and to be made holy. Yes, yes, the yes. Bible says make your heart a holy place for the Lord. It belongs to Jesus, not everybody else. Oh, Lord, help. So the heart is the Lord's place. It's very special. It needs to be protected at all costs. If the heart is a house <coughs> and regeneration of the spirit is the renovation. This is some deep stuff right here. You may not seem that deep, but it's very, very scriptural. If the heart is a house, because see, Jesus said that if, a, if he, when he was talking, teaching about the demon, he said that the demon was cast out, but the demon's going around looking for a house. So the word of God speaks of this temple as a house. <coughs> Where something is, where somebody's going to live. And it ain't just you living up in here, but if you're a believer, then the Holy Spirit's living up in here with you. Yes, yes. And the reason that the word regeneration out of Titus literally means, the one of the words used to describe it is a renovation. <laughs> See, when you got regenerated, you got renovated. How? You ever watch those DIY shows? Well, you can't do it yourself. It's a work of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yes, and whenever it happens, praise God, the Lord's prepared a house where he's moving in. Yes. And now when we talk about virtue and knowledge and endurance and godliness and all of these, one of the words used to describe that is furnishings. I thought that was so good. Furnishings. See, these things added into the house are going to make a place comfortable for the Lord. He's going to want to live in that house. He's going to want to live in that heart. It's very special. And so we're, we're desiring to make it comfortable for him. We have two left. Brotherly kindness and love. That's what it said. It says brotherly kindness or affection. The love of the brethren. Yes, yes, that's right. Amen. And you know what that word is in the Greek? This is really cool. Y'all get some of y'all already probably know. Philadelphia. Isn't that something? <laughs> I don't want to talk about football story. But, <laughs> but it, it, that's amazing. I heard a Saint player say one time a long, long time ago that whenever Bobby Avery said when you go play in Philadelphia, you had to wear your helmet when you walked out onto the field because the fans there would use batteries. And throw them and try to hit them in the head. But anyway, it's supposed to be brotherly love. <laughs> it's, it's supposed to be supposed to be bro brotherly love. Is what the word Philadelphia means brotherly love. It's made up of two different words: phileo or philos and adelphos, the the love of the brothers. And you know, I was thinking that I don't know about you, but sometimes life seems so busy and hectic. And we're always running to the next place. And there's been times in my Christian walk that I haven't, that I felt antisocial. I don't want to really be around people. Worse, there have been times that I didn't like church people. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the preachers. I just want to tell the truth. Because, see, if I've been through some things and the Lord's revealed some things to me, that makes me believe that I'm not the only one. Yes, yes. 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 There's been times I didn't even like church folk. But, you know, that's a problem. Because, see, according to the book of Acts, Christianity as its heart is the fellowship of the saints. Yes. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Yes. As a matter of fact, we'll have our 5 o'clock Bible study this afternoon. Amen. And I want to remind you again, we're going to have host a one accord prayer service next Sunday at 6. So we're going to do Bible study earlier that day because I'm not skipping Bible study. Amen. Amen. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So that's what we're going to do this afternoon. We're going to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. 
and we're going to fellowship, and I think we're going to go ahead and take communion this afternoon because they're going to break bread, and we're going to make sure we say a prayer to where we did all four things that the early church did. They fellowship, they stayed, paid attention to the apostles' doctrine, they took communion, and they stayed faithful in prayers, and guess what happened? And mighty signs and wonders followed the apostles. Listen to me. We want, we, we're hungry for signs and wonders in the church, but are we hungry for the fellowship of the saints? Are we hungry to be reminded of the the death of our glorious Savior when we when we remember and we take communion. I'm, I'm just trying to say we need to have both church. We need to have a love for the brothers and the sisters, and we need to we need to see the moving and the operation and the power of God transforming people's lives, moving in their lives, and, and, and saving them and setting them free. Yes. Yes. And while I was writing, I could hear somebody scream from the crowd, but I don't like people. <laughs> and we've all been in that place, but it's wrong, right? Yes, 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 yes. And listen, if anybody in here thinks that fellowship me, fellowship with with other believers is going to always be smooth sailing, come on now. <laughs> it's a family. Yes. I'm like, well, that, well, yeah, but I, I don't know. <laughs> you never got thrown off with your own family? <laughs> But you see, some, sometimes conflict is, it, well, not only that, conflict is going to be inevitable at some point in time, yes. right? Yeah. It's really how we respond. Yes. 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 Amen. When Christianity is done properly, we don't just look at others and their failures, we examine our own hearts to see what's in theirs. Oh. Yes. So whenever I get thrown off with somebody or somebody gets thrown off with me, what a, I don't know what y'all do, but Pastor Matt needs to look in the mirror first thing. Yes, All right, yes. Lord. <clears throat> and I got to be able to forgive. Amen. Yes. I got to be able to forgive when I'm hurt. Yeah, that's right. Because the, the alternative to that is that I give place to the enemy. That's yes. right. And, you know, oftentimes we think about things like this and I put it in here, but that's work and I'm tired. <laughs> right? Because doesn't it take work like that? And I put it in here, y'all just still love me after I say it. Tell that to Jesus as he carries your death sentence up calories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is work. It's work empowered by the Holy Spirit. Yes, yes. yes. But it's me agreeing with the Holy Spirit that it's work that needs to be done. Yes. Amen. Those are the two remaining furnishings, brotherly love and God's love. And the Greek word for brotherly love or fondness, I told you, is Philadelphia. And it's based off of philos and adelphos. I mentioned the two different words that make that up first because it describes, this is the definition of philia. Describes a love of great fondness and affection. One of the characteristics of biblical Christianity is that there is care, concern, affection, love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes. The Greek word phileo makes a very familiar Bible story or it reminds me of a very familiar Bible story that's more interesting when we understand it from the Greek. OK, and I'm going to I'm going to just share it with you. We're going to keep it kind of easy. In the story I'm referring to, Jesus has already died on the cross. He's resurrected from the tomb. And Peter has fulfilled the prophecy of our Lord in that he denied the Lord three times. And then the rooster crowed. And then Peter says in the, in the gospel, he says, I go fishing. And in the Greek, it's not just like a little fishing trip. Like, oh, let's go catch some sockle or some redfish or whatever people fish for around here. It's like I'm going back to my former way of life because this yes. other thing didn't work out. That's right. And the other disciples said, we go with you. And then all of a sudden they're fishing and Jesus is on the beach. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> And then he says, hey, you got any fish? And they're like, no, nothing. Same thing the way that he met them. He comes back and finds, well, how did the Lord meet you? Where were you when he met you? What's the last thing he told you? When you found yourself ventured away, you need to go back and you need to meet him, meet him where he met you the first time. Come on, somebody. Turn around and go back. Jesus ain't left. He's right there waiting on you. He loves you so much. Hallelujah. 
And he said, did you catch anything? No, we didn't catch it. Throw your net on the other side. It's like, wait, what is going on? And then all of a sudden, Peter's like, it's the Lord. And he rips off his outer garment. He jumps in the water and he swims to the shore. I mean, here he is. He just denied the Lord. He fulfilled yeah. the prophecy. He failed his, his, he loved Jesus, man. Don't tell me Peter didn't love Jesus. I know Peter loved Jesus. He just didn't understand. Yeah. He gets over there on the beach and Jesus is already broiling fish and he got some bread on there on the fire and and then Jesus asks Simon Peter do you love me more than these now I've been digging into that for a long time because see the fish are there and Peter went back fishing did Jesus mean the fish or did Jesus mean the other disciples? Because if you remember the last scene before G Peter denies Jesus, he said, they might forsake you, but I'll never forsake you. So I don't know because I'm trying to dig it out. I don't know which one it is. What you talking about, Jesus? Is it both? I don't know. Do you love me more than these, these fish? This livelihood, this previous life, or do you think you love me more than they love me? I don't know what it is, but that's not really what's important. What I want you to see here is the words love that are being used. He says, Peter, do you love me? See, within this story is both the word phileo and agape. And we already defined it. Phileo, it's defined by kindness and fondness and affection. But let me give you the definition for agape. Out of the, from the Greek scholar Kenneth Wiest. It is the kind of love. It's God kind of love. But it's a love that's sacrificial. And it recognizes the value of the object being loved. Wow. That's really deep. <laughs> it recognizes the value of the object being loved. That means that if, I mean, Naya's never done anything wrong to me, but she's, she, that's why it's easy to use her. If she would do something to me that offended me and something wants to rise up in me to retaliate, to have vengeance. Okay, number one, the word says vengeance is mine, says the Lord, but let's just say that I didn't stop. No, 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 she's going to get hers. She's going to get, I'm going to get my day in court. <laughs> She about to get a what for? <laughs> but the scripture says that agape love recognizes the value of the object that is being loved. Yes. That means you don't have your own rights. You can't hold bitterness and a grudge. You're not allowed to do that because you don't belong to yourself. You were bought with a price. The value of Naya is the blood of Jesus. Yes. Oh, yes. It's a very, very precious thing. Yes, that's true. The value of each and every one of you and the value of Pastor Matt too is the blood of Jesus. Yes. It's beautiful. Thank you, Lord. So again, he asked Peter, Simon Peter, do you agape me more than these? Peter, do you love me with a love that's recognizing my value? Because, listen, if your value is the blood of Jesus, imagine what the value of Jesus is to the Father. Yes. I'm telling you right now, the last couple of days, the Lord's been showing me the love of the Father in a, in a way, and I'm just like, oh, man. He loved Jesus so much. Yes, yes. And that shows you how much he loved you. And Peter's response is, Lord, you know I fight Leo you. You know that I'm so fond of you and I care so much about you. And Jesus, Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? You know I fight Leo, you Lord. And then, Peter, and then, and then Jesus, said, Jesus says, Peter, do you fight Leo me? I mean, do you really? I mean, I, I, 
do you, do you care about me? Do you love me? Do you are you fond of me? Even like a brother would be, because what I need you to do is to agape me. I need you to I need you to love me sacrificially. I need you to feed my sheep. I need you to understand the object of your love the way that I understand you as the object of my love. I laid my life down for you, Peter. And so what he's saying to you as his people, and what he's saying to me is you can't have it your way. You can't have it according to your own will. You can't let hurt get up in your heart and to mess up your relationship with God. You have to love with the love of God. You have no choice in this. And you're like, well, I don't know how to do it. Well, either do I, friend. So welcome to the club. But what we got to do is we got to let our heart be broken in the presence of the Lord. And we got to be willing to let God have his way. Yes. 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 To break us. Yes. So that he can form Christ in us. I guarantee I can pass the microphone around. Because, see, sometimes people say this. They say, but you don't know what they did to me, preacher. <laughs> You're right. I don't know. I don't know what you faced. I don't know what you've been through. I can hand the microphone to at least two people. I'm not going to do it because that would be very awkward. Probably three people in here that can tell you that they were molested by adults. People that were close to them. And that there was probably a period of time in their life where they didn't, where they, that they weren't able to forgive. And they would probably tell you that it only affected them. Yes. Right. Yes. But that whenever they were able to release it to the Lord, freedom came in. Mm. The love of God came in. Yes. And started to change things and to bring hope. That's right. And so I'm just telling you that. Somebody else on the side of you might not understand what you've been through, but I want you to know that Jesus understands. Amen. And I want you to know that he made a way. Amen. And that if you'll trust him with whatever it is, he'll do the work. Amen? Amen. Agape, a sacrificial love that recognizes the value of the object being loved. His love is sacrificial. God has attributed a value to the souls of humanity and the value he placed upon it is the life of the sac and sacrifice of Jesus. Peter, do you uh, God pay me? You know, the thoughts of these words made me think of a of the, of the parable of the prodigal son. I had just read it, so it was fresh in my mind. But then I started thinking about the story of the prodigal son. And the reason why I thought about it was because it has the love of the father in it. A love of the father. I'm going to talk to you about the story here in a second because maybe some people you, maybe you've never heard of. But it also has the story, in the story is two brothers. And I'm thinking about brotherly love. So if you remember the story, G Jesus is telling the story about the prodigal. The word prodigal literally means uh, to just live extravagantly, right? And, and in the story, it says a man had two sons. And the man was obviously a wealthy landowner. And his youngest son came to him and said, Father, give me my inheritance. I'm ready to go. And so the father, I know he didn't want to do that, but he did. What, because, see, it's a... It's the story of you and it's the story of me and yes. you've been given a free will and God the Father is not going to make you do anything. Amen. And so in this free will, he says, give me what's mine. I'm going. And so he, he split it up and he gave it to the young man. And the word of God says that there was a famine in the land and that the man became destitute and to the point where he even had to indenture himself as a servant to the point where he had to feed the hogs. Mm -hmm. Now for a Jewish man, that's very low and very unclean. Yeah. And maybe you've never been that low before, but I've been in some pretty unclean places. I thank the Lord that he saved me out of the Mari clay. Amen. Amen. But the word, the word says that that's where the word fiending comes from. It says he feigned to eat the pig slop. He was, he was so hungry. He was so famished. And he was so bound up that he, that he just, but nobody would give him. Because the family was so harsh. And then all of a sudden he came to his senses and he said, My father, and there's, there's servants in my father's house that are living better than this. I'm going back to my father and he's going to take care of me. He's going to at least allow me to have a servant's job. And so in this picture, I'm seeing that the, that the prodigal's coming home and his daddy sees it. Listen, Jewish men did not get up and take off running. 
There's a lot of reasons for it. I'm not going to get into all the details. But first of all, he would have probably been a very stately person. But you know what he did? He jumped up and he took off running. He took off running and he said, I don't want to hear all that nonsense, boy. Because he said, Father, I have sinned against you and God. Yes. Yes. See, that's true repentance. We have to come to a place where we realize that we did. We sinned against God. But God has a plan and a way to bring forgiveness. And so he's coming back and he's saying, I sinned against you and God. Then his father immediately wraps him up in his arms. Amen. Puts a robe on him. Right? Puts the ring on his finger. Hallelujah. Kill a fatted calf. Your son was, my, my, my son was lost and now he's home. But listen, in the background, you see this other silhouette. Mm. Sitting there in the field with his arms crossed. Tells the servant, come over here. Whispering in his ear, what's up with all that? Your brother. Your all of the brothers come home. Yeah. Can you feel that already? Yeah. See, that's what I'm trying to get you to do. I don't even have the adjectives to try to describe the things that happen in our heart. The animosity, the bitterness. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I know y'all do because y'all are human beings. That's right. And when people do us wrong, or when we feel like, or the envy, and the jealousy that we'll, that we'll feel. How it feels, right? It's ugly. Y'all know what I mean? No, if the day star has risen in your heart, you know it's ugly. Yeah. Yes. If the day star hadn't risen in your heart yet, you might be like, well, I got a right to hold on to this. Right? <laughs> no, you know. Not if you belong to him. But anyway, so I just imagine, you know, and, 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 the, and the scripture actually says, and then, then I remembered then I remembered why Jesus even was talking about this story. So I went up a couple of verses and here you go. Luke 15, one and two. Then drew near unto him all the publicans, which means tax collectors and sinners to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes, the religious people murmured, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Murmuring. And murmuring. <laughs> Complaining. See, I believe as we read the Gospels and we see the Pharisees who were filled with envy, jealousy, and even hate compared to Jesus, who is filled with sacrificial love, what the Lord's been showing me even more clearly lately is, is that we have to search our hearts. Because you see, there's two characters in the story that are making these stories move on. The protagonist is Jesus. He's moving forward in the story. And the Pharisees and the scribes are the antagonists. And they're coming against Jesus the whole time. And what the Lord is, and then there's the sinners. And we see the heart of Jesus towards those that are lost and hurting. Amen. And, and, and then we see the religious folk. And see, I've been in this long enough to know, unfortunately, churches many times are filled with Pharisees. Filled with religious people that don't really have the love of God operating in their hearts. And I said this recently, and I'm going to say it again. The danger of a Pharisaical sin is that it's pride. And the danger with pride is that you can't see it. Again, people that are bound in other types of sin, they know, especially whenever it's a secret sin that they're hiding, they know, and many times they're not okay with it. And if they are okay with it, let me, let me just say this real clear. If you are okay with your secret sin and you know it's against the word of God, you, be, you may not be saved. Yeah. You may not. It's, it's a possibility you're not saved. Because God's not okay with it. Amen. But the one with the pride, the problem with that is you can't see it. You don't even know you have it. Right. And, and, and so it says that they murmured. And so what I've been thinking is, is that I really got to look at these stories in a whole new light. And I got to question my own heart. <laughs> you, you know, Lord, am I acting like them? Do I have something in my heart that's like them? Or do I have in my heart what's like you? The word murmur is described that there's discontent. There's a grudge. 
There's feeling of ill will. Frustration is wrapped up in a murmur and is described as a secret displeasure that is not openly avowed. It's not openly spoken of. It's on the inside and it's tearing you up. And it's got, you got the feeling. You can feel it, my friend. You know it. The irritation, the animosity, the ill will, the grudge, the envy, the jealousy. Oh, man, my sister just got promoted in the ministry or my sister just hallelujah preached a fire message amen and God showed up and ministered to people's hearts praise God there's been times listen there's been times I've shared this with y'all and look you can throw spaghetti at me later but look back at the old church where I was going to and I'll say it and to me maybe he'll watch the video and I think I shared it with it before anyway Brad Bullock, man, I'm telling you right now, that was one of the best preachers I ever sat under as far as communicating the gospel. And I can remember literally sitting in the audience. Now, this is after the message of the cross. This is after understanding what it means to be crucified in Christ. And he said something about something, and I thought to myself, man, I could preach that better than that. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit said, did you just hear what you said? Mm -hmm. That's in your heart. Spirit of Cain. You better check that boy. You better check that because if you let that run rampant in you, you'll end up being something that you didn't even know. Come on. Help us, Lord. So it's it's something that's in there and it's not right. And and look, I started all this by saying that the heart is the place that belongs to the Lord. It's a special place. Yes. It's his place with you and his, his intimacy with you and he loves you and wants to be intimate with you. You don't want to let those feelings of displeasure grow, amen? I can remember being a young boy and it always used to catch me. I can remember like it was yesterday. This has happened to me a few times in life where the, the topic of hate was being discussed and all of a sudden I can remember it. I don't hate anybody. I didn't say you hated anybody. <laughs> But it's almost like people rise to the, I don't hate anyone. But see, sometimes I don't know what our definition of hate is. You see what I'm getting at? Because one of the definitions of hate that I looked up means it means to detest and to have a strong dislike. Y'all know that there's been at least three times in the church where I asked everybody, okay, look at the per look at look around the room and make eye contact with somebody. Y'all heard y'all remember when I've done that? I'm not gonna make you do it right now. But like, okay, everybody, and the first time I did it, I caught y'all on guard. I said, and the Lord put it on my heart. I said, go ahead and look around the room, make eye contact with somebody, and say a little smile. And then I said, okay, now, how many did you make eye contact with anybody? You're like, mm, yeah, that's you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. Hey, boo. Did you see you made it to the house of the Lord? <laughs> see, I'm trying to make it real to you because it's trying to tell you that something's not right. And he will, he won't relate until he has it all. My heart is. He wants our heart. <coughs> and while we don't hate, I wonder if we recorded our murmuring sessions and played them back if we would feel the same way about what was in our hearts after we heard a playback. I can't shake those words that Jesus spoke to the Pharisees a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night when I was reading them out of Matthew, and I'm just going to read it. He just, Jesus said this to the Pharisees. Look, just go on and either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. O oh, generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by your word you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Yes. Amen. Yes, that's right. And I think of Love versus hate and biblical encouragement versus murmuring. And I think about brotherly love and even more agape love, a love that is sacrificial. Yes. 
A love that understands the value of the object being loved. Listen, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I haven't been hurt by people and I had not struggled, but I know when something doesn't feel right and when it happens, I got to bring that to the Lord, man. I This place belongs to Jesus. Amen. Okay, I got a bunch of scripture. I don't know that I'm going to, I'm just going to read them to you. Okay. I don't, I, it's hard for me not to read them because it's just so good. First John 13 and 34. You can put this one up. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He goes on in verse 35 to say this. By this shall all men know you are my, my disciples if you have loved one to another. <coughs> look, at, look at 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If a man says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen. See, that's why I did that whole lesson with what is the definition of hate. Because, see, we can come up with our own definition of hate and say, well, that ain't me, preacher. But the reality of it is, is that we, gotta, we need to dig a little bit deeper because this is a really big deal. Because, see, I don't know about you, but I don't want to go face the Lord and I have animosity and awe in my heart towards other believers or other human beings. And just to stand there on that day and to realize that I did not let the Lord have his way in my heart. You, you know what I'm saying? Do you understand that that's why I'm doing this? I'm doing this not just so that you'll come back next Sunday. I hope you do. But what I'm really doing it for is because I care. I, I care about my heart and I care about my soul and I care about your heart and I care about your soul. And there's one opportunity when we meet him on the other side. Amen. <clears throat> oh, so what are you saying? I'm not saying. No, that's not what I'm saying. And we'll get into that in a second. But he says this. He says, for he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him that he who loves God loves his brother also. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Right, I've thought about that. Like, who's my neighbor? Okay, then the next thing is, who's my brother? Right? If we're looking for a loophole, I'll be looking for a loophole. But who's really my brother? Because Peter even said in the beginning, we write this to people who have acquired a like faith to ours. That, that is actually an interesting thing. I mean, we broke that down last week. But, but do you realize that he was saying something? That, that there's a true faith. Yes, yes. yes. And that there's and, and that there's people that maybe say that they have that they're in the faith, but they're not. Yeah. That that's really what he's getting at there. There's a lot of people that say that they're in the faith, but they're not really in the faith. And and to me, I'm very concerned about that. I'm very concerned about that because and I'm very concerned about pastors. And all I can do is pray for them. I'm very concerned about my own self. And how I'm going to have to stand before God. And I'm very concerned about the modern church. Because something has happened to where we're, we're so concerned about pleasing people. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. To, where, to where we can make sure they come back. Come on. So we can get good tithes and offerings so that the board will be pleased with us. Mm. And we're not allowed to really speak the truth. And how is that going to work when you stand before God? Yes. And sadly, many of these people, they're, they're not even doing it like they genuinely think they're doing the right thing. Because they've been brought up in a... You, you know, whenever Josiah... This is not even close to being in my notes. You know when Josiah became king at eight years old? And then, I don't know, he was probably a teenager when they found the book of the law, they found the book of Moses. like... Look at this book I found when we were working on the temple. Goodness gracious, the law of Moses. Let's go read this to King Josiah. And they go read it to King Josiah. And the Bible says he ripped his clothes. And he's like, oh my God, this is what we've been doing. Because see, in the temple, they had something called a shearer poles. I'm not going to get into all the details of it. Well, it's a male phallus. Let me just tell you what it is. It's the same thing as the Washington Monument. It's the same thing that the Vatican has. I'll probably show up in the message coming up soon. But, but this, is, this is what I'm trying to tell you. is They had that in the house of God. 
generation after generation growing up and that this was the norm and that they were convinced this was normal Christianity. The Lord showed me this 12 years ago. This is what's happening in my church, son. Generation after generation has, and maybe not that many generations, but starting back in about the 1940s, something started to shift in the church world and things started changing. And many of you maybe don't even know this, but it's affected between the seeker sensitive movement and the and some of the improper moves of the word of faith, it wasn't all wrong. But whenever all of these things started to happen, it changed the dynamics of what true biblical Christianity was. And people have been growing up in this seeker sensitive environment. And that, that now whenever you hear the truth of God's word spoken and it pierces the heart, we, we become offended and we think then you, the word of God offends. Jesus is a, he's a stumbling block. He's a, he's the rock of, he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Yes, yes. The, the religious leaders didn't want it. The, the truth of the gospel will pierce your heart. Amen. It's not supposed to leave you the way you were. Yes. It, that, that we would not stay the same that we that we've been. We're supposed to be. We're, our cage is supposed to be rattled. Amen. Yes. Wouldn't you be rather be rattled on this side than on the other side? Yes. <laughs> so you know who's, who's my brother he, Jesus, Jesus said this to him he said you've heard it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy but I say to you love your enemies pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust yes. for if you love those who love you what reward do you have and that's something we always love in the people that love us Make me feel good about myself. I need a couple of friends that don't always make me feel good about myself. <laughs> For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father. See, it's a heart thing. Y'all seeing it, right? It. I'm working real hard trying to make you see it. It's a heart thing. It's a condition of the heart. Yeah. And your heavenly father, That's right. he's not quitting, amen. He's not quitting on you. First John 2.10 says, he that loves his brother abides in the light and there's no occasion of stumbling in him. This is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Yeah. I know I've told this story before, but my brother-in-law Aaron has this collection of uh, the early church fathers. This is a huge volume in his house. And he was like, you know what? I think it was Polycarp was a disciple of John. And, you know, the closer. It's kind of interesting to think, oh, wow. Dude, I, there was a guy named Polycarp that was a disciple of John the Beloved, who was a disciple of Jesus. Right? And then, and then I think it was Irenaeus, I want to say, was a disciple of Polycarp. And he did a lot of writing. But anyway, they said that towards the end of John's life, because, you know, he wrote Revelation on the Isle of Patmos. And that was like, they say, 95 years old or something like that. So they said towards the end, whenever they'd have church service, they'd help him get, they'd help him get to where he was. They'd prop him up against something. And with tears streaming down his eyes, he said, the master said to love. And then they just all break down in tears. <laughs> Hallelujah and off the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine that? John the Beloved. Speaking and just the anointing hitting and just everybody's heart's getting ready. Yes. The master said to love. And this is what he's writing in these letters. He just keeps writing it. There was 10 of them. 10 of them. They just kept talking about love. But this is the one I want to, you can put this one up for me, Haley. 1 John 4, 8 through 10. I'm in the King James Version. He says, he that loveth not, knoweth not God. Come on. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Herein is love. You want to talk about, there's a whole lot of talk about love out there, my friend. And let me just say this. This right here is saying Herein is love. No, we didn't love God. He loved us. And he sent his son. 
to be the object upon which he poured out his wrath. <clears throat> that's, that's, what it, that's what the word propitiation means. He poured out his wrath. All the sin, all the offense of the human race that had thrown, thrown it in the face of God, a loving God who created man in his own image and after his own likeness and in disobedience had marred the image of God upon the earth. In the midst, but he always had a plan. And his plan was that he was going to pour out his wrath on his son. I'll never forget. I mean, I asked my brother John to share that. <laughs> he told me that he was at work. And he said, man, he said, the Lord gave me something to say to this guy at work. And he said, I told him, I said, brother, I care about you. I, I care about you, man. I consider you a friend. And he said, we're all on a journey. And we're on a journey towards wrath. I mean, this is, you got, this is truth what he's saying. We're all on a journey towards judging. And my concern for people is that when they get there, either their judgment was placed on Jesus or they're standing there and they're being asked by the Father, what did you do with my son upon whom yeah. I poured out my wrath? Mm -hmm. So when we think about love, I'm just saying we have to think about this. Here in his love, yes. he sent his son upon which he poured out wrath. You know the good news is this is that is that it's just that he's just a whisper away. That's the beauty of the Lord. See, you might be in this place this morning and maybe you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're like, man, I don't know. I, I thought I was coming to church to feel good about, you know, to feel good when I left, and I feel weighted down. Well, guess what? You don't have to leave weighted down. Peter said this that with repentance comes refreshing. Yes, amen. Like a cold, refreshing breeze. Amen. Got to recognize that I've lived against you, Lord. I've sinned against you, right? And even as believers, Jesus. many times we'll get ourselves caught up in a situation, but when the Lord begins to reveal, all we got to do is lower ourselves under His mighty hand. He's looking, and, and amen, and then He'll lift that burden off, and you'll feel the goodness of God. You'll feel the joy of God. I'm telling you right now, it'll meet you. Like, people be meeting you in the parking lot wanting to talk about Jesus. That's another thing. We're not going to get into that right now, but look, when somebody comes up to you and they rather talk about Jesus rather than how high a quarterback can jump and you're more excited about how high a quarterback can jump than Jesus, then you know what? Maybe, I don't know, there might be an eclipse on the day star or something going wrong. <laughs> Lord, no. So I'm just going to go ahead and close and the musician, y'all can make your way up here. We're going to we're going to definitely uh, ask them to play us a song. We're going to worship the Lord. I want, you, I want the altars to be open. If anyone feels as though you have something that you need to bring to the Lord, amen. But in 2 Peter 1, 8, he says, If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind and that he's forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Verse 11. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to know something. Number one is when it says confirm your calling, it's not saying that you're earning your salvation. It's saying that the Lord, one day he's looking for some receipts, <laughs> right? I purchased you. Oh, I purchased you. Okay, let me see some receipts. Okay, well, we know that it's the blood of the Lamb. But what he's saying is, are you did you really get saved? Because, see, if you really get saved and the love of God is in you, then the sooner or later it's going to start coming out of you. Yes. Amen. Amen? That's what he's saying. And so he's saying, I want you to confirm your calling. Add, make sure you're adding these to your faith. And, and if, they're, if they're there, then you're going to have an entrance into the eternal kingdom richly provided for you. The King James says abundantly. I, I don't remember how time to 
do it. If, if we were a big church, I'd say, hey, could y'all go get me some rose petals or something? And, and I'd have a, uh, like, a, I said, because we, you know, we have somebody to sign that. And then a, 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 a basket. And I'd have a bunch of rose petals. And I'd be like, hallelujah, Tina. And I'd start throwing, hallelujah, Robert. And I'd throw these rose petals in the door, confetti or something. It's like, I'm going to receive you abundantly. Uh, entrance richly provided unto you into the eternal kingdom. And, and I just want you to know there's a celebration that's taking place. Because you had these things that you had it and you confirmed your calling. You didn't sit around and question whether or not you were really in. You confirmed your calling. One scholar I read behind said this. He said it's the opposite of what's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. Put that up there, 1 Corinthians. It's the opposite of that. It's the reverse of 1 Corinthians 3, 15. Look at this. See, so there's between a man that's work is silver, gold, and precious gems versus hay, wood, and stubble. You listen to me, church. It's so important that you allow yourself to hear the word of God. It's so important that you understand because there's so many people that are skating through in life and they think that they're okay and they're going to see the master one day and they're going to be so sad and disappointed because even though they make it in, because that's what it says, they were saved but only as through fire. And in the Greek, the idea is that they had almost like they had smoke coming off their clothes. Like they, they made it in, but all their works were burned up. How sad would that be? That, 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 Cause see, the true heart of the true believer is that he's working for the king because the king worked for him, and that he understands he's going to lay it all down at the feet of Jesus because the day star prison in the heart, and you and you done fell in love with him. You done fell in love with the one that saved you. And he's saying that where we were reading is the opposite: an abundant reception. And it's the opposite of the one that was just barely saved, but as though through fire. I don't know about you, but I want to be the one that's, that gets an abundant blessing. Like, I want the Lord to, and it's only because of Jesus. Amen? It's all because of Jesus. So listen, maybe you're here this morning. Maybe you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you desire to be born again. You desire to call on the name of Jesus that you the altars are going to be open I would love to pray with you have somebody pray with you maybe you've been going through something in your life and you feel like it's pulling you away and you feel like you've had animosity in your heart listen I just want to say this if you just want to come to the front and get along with you and Jesus if you get down on your face at the altar we're going to know Be welcome to be along with the Lord as they begin to sing. If you feel led by the Holy Spirit.